Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, usually, the private sector is the last. <laughs> usually, the way I, I would structure it, actually, private sector should be first, and then the government should be second, right? <laughs> okay, but thank you for uh, hanging out with, with all of us and appreciate your patience. I think this is going to be the more interesting session, I, I hope, because we have distinguished speakers. Uh, um, of course, Pak Yos Ginting is uh, also a colleague of mine in Gandhi and Napindo from Sampurna, Anthony Fang, thank you for being very patient, from Zalora, uh, Anne Levine from Google, thank you for being here. I think there's a lot of questions, I'm sure, from the audience after the minister's uh, speech about, about e-commerce and IT. Ibu Jane, welcome back to Jakarta. Uh, Ibu Jane is the Asia Pacific. I know her, uh, a person who actually, you know, never retreat for competitiveness in, in services sectors. Thank you for being here. And Cynthia Derry, nice to meet you. ASR is uh, similar to ISD, but in Australia. So without further ado, I think maybe just the highlights of what Ibu Mari Pangestu, Professor Finlay also mentioned since this morning. It's actually Indonesia services sector is uh, you know growing in, in GDP, it's growing in employment, but we're not competitive enough compared to ASEAN countries. And I think listening from all the doers in the economy, we will understand about challenges and opportunities from those who, even though Pak pa Menteri Brojonegoro says that manufacturing and services, as if it's a two different sectors, but I think what Pak Rudiantara mentioned earlier, it's all interrelated, it is all interconnected, because manufacturing is part of services, or services is part of manufacturing, and I'm sure Pak Yos, and Zalora can actually be testament on that, and perhaps we can listen also a lot of the best practices in Australia and and uh, from Ibu Jane. So without further ado, maybe part pa yours because we have a very limited time, 45 minutes. And I want everybody to to share as much as experience and also to get as much uh, uh, questions from the audience. So silakan pa. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It's a great uh, honor to take part in this panel discussion uh, to discuss about services uh, sector. Um, and I'd like to discuss especially services sector as an member of the global uh, value chain. As you may already uh, know, uh, a large part of my company business is in manufacturing. And that's probably you wonder why I am in this panel. As a short uh, introduction, uh, Sampurna is one of the country's largest uh, taxpayer, operating for more than 100 years. To be exact, it's 103 years this year. And we are very committed to our roots in um, Indonesia. Sampurna has been one of the largest investors in Indonesia with a long-term and continued investment. And we believe our investment has provided uh, employment opportunities, support, supported the state revenue through our tax payments and developed the downstream sector of the industry. I would like to uh, share uh, three slides. Uh, slides uh, number one. Uh, in the modern world, business like us is basically forced to adopt the global value chain or otherwise we cannot maintain our competitiveness and would fail to meet customers expectations as any other manufacturing business from time to time uh, we will have to source raw materials and other supporting uh, components uh, or even services from outside Indonesia uh, simply because probably there is not enough uh, supply or we need certain materials or services which are just not available uh, locally it is also very natural for businesses to embrace the global value chain concept as logically you cannot find everything that you need in only one country or even in one region. Next slide, please. Uh, with the global value chain concept, the main thinking is how to create value and to trade in value added. In this regard, services sectors contribute greatly to the successful growth of consumer goods industry. In the production process, we can imagine how much value uh, have been added to the single product. As you can see on the slide, before we can produce anything, we need to be good at designing the product. 
we will then need to invest heavily in research and development. And then to make it successful, we have to invest or there has to be an available um, infrastructure in terms of uh, distributions, logistics, etc. Again, we rely heavily on service providers, starting from designers, consultants, market research agencies, logistic, public relations, lawyers, uh, and so on. The last slide. And this is very important part. At the very end of the value chain, um, you, you can see the brand. Brand is a big word. It agreeably creates the most value in a product. For that reason, I want to spend some time to talk about the importance of a brand. Brands and or trademarks communicate information to consumers about quality, about origin, and other characteristics that enable a producer to distinguish its product from its competitors. Consumers identify products through brands, which facilitates efficiency in purchasing and confidence in product selection. Therefore, for every business, brands uh, are the determining aspect in a successful competition. You can go and ask the companies listed on the slide. We have Google there, value in 2015 at 173.6 billion US dollar. Uh, very, very high value. Uh, at the top is Apple, uh, 246 point, uh, 247 uh, billion US dollar. As a recent report to the World Intellectual Property Organization, or WIPO, concludes brands are an indispensable guide for consumers and means for companies to build a reputation and image in the marketplace. By protecting, an exclusivity, by protecting their exclusivity, trademarks enable market economies to function more effectively. Firms of every size and uh, form and from virtually every sector of the economy rely on trademarks when seeking to gain edge on competitors. And I'd like to stress again, because in services, um, brand, uh, see in services, because the, um, the entry uh, barrier uh, are relatively lower compared to manufacturing, for example, therefore whoever gets start with services and build their brand must uh, be extremely uh, protective for their brands, because otherwise, uh, what you have built can easily be uh, diminished by not protecting your brand. And we recently um, uh, observed uh, a worrying trend of regulation that intends to protect public health, uh, animal welfare, or the environment, among other public objectives, through the regulations of labeling, for example, or packaging. Regulation for consumer goods that require the use of trademark in a special form that ban some types of trademarks for entire categories of products, or that mandate the use of disproportionate health warning, which will undermine trademarks' ability to fulfill their main function. But that would be a separate discussion, of course, in another uh, summit. To conclude, there is a great need for the government to promote and nurture services sectors to help us in the manufacturing sector. That way, we can go up in the value chain and be stronger in supporting the economic growth in Indonesia. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. As you might notice that uh, Marlboro is the brand that he represents. Uh, okay, Ibu Jane, Silakan Ibu, please. The floor is yours. Thank you. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, and friends, many friends in the audience. Now, I was asked to speak to you today as convener of the Asia Pacific Services Coalition, so I probably have to explain what that is. Um, but I want, I want to start by Really, time is so short, and so much has already been said today that what I really want to do is congratulate you all here on what you've achieved. The first time that I was asked to address an audience of Indonesian services stakeholders was in Jakarta in October 2009, so it was just before ISD actually existed, but many of you in the room were actually there in that room then too. Certainly Ibu Mari was there and others also from the business community that I've met again today. And I think uh, it's very important to take a moment and reflect and congratulate yourselves actually on all that effort and personal um, energy that's gone into building the, the momentum to put services on the agenda for public discourse in Indonesia and it really is something I want to recognise. Now, 
it was very clear right back in that meeting in 2009 that the reason for doing this was because of the potential gain in productivity that could come right across the whole economy. And we've heard a couple of times today, most recently from, from Stephen Barraclough, but earlier from even Murray, that things went quiet for a while. They went quiet for a while in Indonesia, and they went quiet for a while in Australia too. And why is that? Because we had commodity booms and mining booms, things were going well. And when things go well, the harder things tend not to be done. And why is services seen as harder? Partly because it requires this coordination across more than just one ministry. And all by itself, that is something that needs to be focused on. Now, the second time that I was formally asked to address ISDS was in April 2013 in Surabaya. And that particular meeting, uh, this time ISD formally existed, but it was also the first time ever that there had been a public-private dialogue on services in the context of APEC chaired by Indonesia, extremely important because that meeting in Surabaya actually, I think, put ISD on the map, on the map certainly in APEC, but on the map globally. Public-private dialogue in services in the APEC region is now here to stay. Indonesia held the first one. Last year there were four held by APEC. This year in Peru there will be another two. And from, from where I stand, having watched this sector that typically has had no voice in public discourse get to the point where governments are formally putting it on the agenda regularly is really important. And today we've all witnessed uh, your own trade minister this morning, his remarks, for example, just show how far you've come. Now. What you've been doing here in Indonesia actually hasn't gone unnoticed. And we had a very important development last year in the wider regional context, starting perhaps with some of your ASEAN neighbours, that, gosh, what Indonesia's doing here to have a stakeholder group that includes not only services producers, but services consumers and the academics that bring the, gut, the evidence base and the government players is a pretty unusual and interesting thing. And many of your neighbours in the wider region have started to think they should do something like this too. And so last year, and it was pushed along partly by Cardin Indonesia and Apindo through ABAC Indonesia, but with some help from ABAC Philippines and some push along also from Hong Kong and Singapore, there was um, a meeting, the first ever meeting at which Cinta and I met in the Philippines of 14 business associations from around the region, 14 of us, extraordinary. Certainly Indonesia Services Dialogue and Australian Services Dialogue, but gosh, there were 12 others and a real um, sense that the services sector everywhere needs a voice and needs some institution building around that voice. We also had observers from Europe, from the European Services Forum and from the new Latin American Services Organization and we actually formed this thing called the Asia Pacific <coughs> Services Coalition. And we meet again in six weeks time in Beijing at the China Fair for International Trade and Services. Now, that, that location is important because we will all witness um, what is probably world's best practice in trade promotion of services activities. None of our governments are any good at this, so the business associations are going to go to Beijing and see it and hopefully bring back some guidance to our governments on how one can display this stuff at a fair. It's not obvious. But I think um, it's important to just recall that this new coalition actually gives us a chance to um, share our experiences in forming these kinds of organisations 
in thinking through the agenda domestically and regionally and in sharing best practice on how we do things. So I'm very hopeful that this has taken us a good step further ahead. We've also been invited uh, to Peru to talk to the public-private dialogue on services this year, which is all about developing the roadmap for APEC on services, with a big focus on structural reform and the role of services in generating growth. Now, one of the things I want to say before I quickly wind up is that one of the things we're talking to each other about is what do all these mega regionals mean for us? What, what does TPP, what does RCEP, what does ATISA or TISA or even Belt and Road, Maritime Silk Road or FTAAP, what do these big things mean for us? Ultimately, these new kinds of trade agreements are agreements about connectivity across global value chains and regional value chains. Increasingly, we're realising that Business is more doing business with other business, even more than directly with consumers. And once we start to see that we're playing in a value chain, we begin to see that there are opportunities there for all of us and that this is really a win-win um, opportunity for cooperation. And our big message, I think, repeatedly is going to be that it's time for the regulators themselves to talk to each other more as well. We're interested not just in, in our own regulatory regimes, but we're very interested in connectivity because disconnects between our different regulatory regimes cause big costs for business. So I think that that is our agenda. Um, we, we have heard a lot about productivity today, um, and I don't think I've got time actually to go into the data I was going to present on productivity, so I'll leave it for another time. And, and just um, say really that I think it is relevant to note the World Bank's research very recently on monitoring the ASEAN integration and the impact that the World Bank is estimating there from the deeper integration through services that will be delivered and even more so for the um, resource-rich economies. So very six times more growth generated through the services integration agenda in ASEAN than through the goods side of things. I don't have time to go into it, but it's interesting. So my messages are the private sector is really important in this. Um, we're all in this same experiment together. Hopefully this services summit will have re-energised and reinforced your own determination to get on with it. As Ivu Murray said, a lot of opportunities have been lost. So no more lost opportunities for Indonesia. Uh, next, uh, we would like to invite uh, Ms. Anne Levine from Google. I quoted Pak Rudiantara's uh, comment about Google has to have its legal entity in Indonesia. And then, after you pay taxes, then everything is okay. So, <laughs> it's easy for me to start because Google's had a legal entity in Indonesia since 2011. Perfect. So, uh, it's BT Indonesia. <laughs> start with. I'm, actually, I'm hoping that a lot of the knowledge that's been shared on this stage today just absorbs into me because I've heard so many things to think about today that it's almost overwhelming. But I just want to quickly um, run through some facts. Um, let me go to the next slide. So you, uh, so you guys know way more about the supply chain than I do, but it's I know it's really complex. But what I do know also is that technology is both an enabler and a driver in making this supply chain work better. So I want to take a little bit of time to talk about how the role of technology in all of this. You know, earlier today, a uh, discussion about you know, what's e-commerce. And I have to say that in the last seven days, that's the third time I've heard that sort of question asked. And I have to say that I don't have an answer because I think you can slice and dice it. So what I like to think about is just a broader digital economy, which allows me to cast the net a little bit broader. Uh, so can I go to the next slide? So really want to talk about economic growth, right, and the power of the internet 
to actually push forward and make it easier for regional and global trade, that it allows this information to move faster, it allows goods to move faster, it allows, it allows information sharing better. So it helps pe people and companies find better ways of doing things, find better suppliers, find better information. Um, it helps businesses reach out and find customers better. So it does all those things. And so, you know, we have a broad discussion about but what's the real contribution. So McKinsey says it's 3% of GDP. Uh, BCG says it's 8%, so we'll just call it 5.5, right? Um, let's put the difference. But we know it's a real, it's a meaningful contribution. And um, in fact, McKinsey says that the global, this global e-commerce sector, whatever that is, is bigger than the energy sector. So globally. So that, that's a big number. But you know, and Asia is actually the big player in this. So the um, Alibaba is uh, net value is greater than Amazon and eBay combined, right? I mean, so Asia is really reshaping this, and so there should there should be actual real confidence in how all of Asia can play in this space and be super successful. Um, and of course now is the cost of smartphones, devices go down, it really changes the picture in Asia even more. The next slide. Um, so look at this, like in APEC, look, the internet is mobile, right? All, most people coming online in Asia are coming online through their smartphone. And that really changes the way people do this. So um, five out of the top 10 global markets for smartphone penetration are in Asia, right? Uh, with half the world subscribers are in Asia, 1.8 billion people. And this is going to grow by 2020 by an additional 600 million people. So this is going to be the dominant space. And what's going to happen in that is that um, people behave on mobile phones differently than they do on other devices. And that behavior is going to shape these markets and how people use, use phones. And it will be those Asian consumers that shape the market. And so that creates all sorts of opportunities in Asia as well, right? To do things differently, better, and really lead the way. Um, a little example, right? In Thailand, 31% of smartphone owners buy things online. So, I mean, probably makes sense to people in Asia. But in the US, that number's 10%, right? And in the UK, it's 7%. And I'm going to promise you that smartphone penetration is higher in those markets. Yet, because that mobile phone is your first tool, it's your comfortable tool. And it changes things. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Um, just a little bit on Indonesia, right? Uh, internet user growth is you know, 58%, growing 58% annually. And that's a massive number. 34% uh, of the population online. I, they're really being able to do things. This is, it's a dynamically changing market uh, that holds an enormous amount of possibility. On to the next slide. Um, so I just want to talk about a little bit about this mobile economy, right? Because it's a little bit different than just the internet economy. And um, so you look at the mobile internet revenue in Australia, China, India, Japan, and South Korea. It's about $300 billion. Now, that's more than the mobile internet in the US. It's more than twice the five biggest economies in Europe combined. I mean, it's a massive number. And by 2017, it's going to more than double to $622 billion. So these are big changes and big opportunities. And it's also, um, it's again, worth noting that it does create these different behaviors in. Um, you know, the conventional wisdom is that, you know, all this internet stuff, it's all from the, it's all Silicon Valley. It's all those guys in California making these deals, making it all work, but it's not true. The majority of tech startups are now come from outside the Silicon Valley. Four out of ten, the largest internet companies by stock value are in Asia. And you look, look, look at Indonesia right now, right? Uh, Asian mobile apps like Line or Grab Taxi or WeChat, right? They're challenging the tech of giants. They're challenging Apple. They're challenging Uber, Google, and Facebook. And these are Asian companies that are really changing the markets and changing the world. 
And um, so what does Asia stand to gain from all of this, right? Well, it looks like a contribution of about you a, a little over uh, $56 uh, billion dollars, uh, going into added to the GDP um, in ASEAN by 2020. So $56 billion more added to ASEAN's uh, GDP by 2020. And that's going to be a million new jobs in ASEAN. Now, you know, I think with simple math, we'd figure out that a sizable portion of those jobs are going to be right here in Indonesia. Uh, next slide. And so I would be remiss if I didn't touch on SMBs really quickly, because what this digital economy does is give SMBs greater reach, right? You're not dependent on your customers being the people who pass by, but you're able to reach out to more to more customers in more places. It's really the rocket fuel. The internet's a rocket fuel for small businesses. Uh, so let's move forward. So 93% of small businesses that have an online presence have actually fulfilled an overseas order. So they're actively involved in global trade, even if it's just one order. Um, but they're also three times more likely to export than SMBs that don't have an online presence. So they can, they can, they're very, and they also tend to create 2.6 more jobs than not, than SMBs that aren't online. And, but the big part is they get to be part of a bigger, more important global supply chain, and they're dependent on all the other pieces of that supply chain to work smoothly to help them out. Uh, next slide. Uh, I just want to talk really quickly, because you'll think this is crazy. Why is she talking about YouTube? Um, but I think it actually it shows how everything has an impact on the global supply chain. So you say, um, like, how popular culture shapes things. So think a little bit about um, <coughs> Korean dramas. Maybe you've watched them. Maybe you're familiar with K-pop. But right, those are a phenomenon that got, became widely shared online. And what they had this real follow-on effect. Yeah, of course, people bought more Korean dramas, and they bought more K-pop. But what they also did is said, I want to travel to South Korea more than they did before. What they said is, I think that South Korea is probably an edgy, interesting place for fashion. It's probably a place with you know, uh, great makeup and design. And it totally changed the picture of Korea in this creative space. Just like, you know, if we look at sort of creative Indonesia, really having this opportunity to connect to the world and change the perception about Indonesia, its creativity, and what the country is all about. Uh, so this is this is uh, you know, and you might also say, like, you know, yeah, I'll spare myself a later question. You know, but how does this whole YouTube make money? And look, Google makes the money through the ads, but we share that revenue with our our content creative partners. So there are over a million channels on YouTube that earn money from ads from from Google for their content on YouTube. And we paid, just in the music sector over the last couple of years, we paid out over a billion dollars to content creators. So, uh, so not only can they promote Indonesia, but we can also have an opportunity for the creators to make money. Um, and finally, I just want to touch on data-driven innovation, because people in the, the smart companies in the, slope, in the global supply chain have been the leaders in data-driven innovation. They've been the people who always use data to drive better business decisions do better with resources, do better with timing. Um, and now we find we're in a space where governments can do that too, and hopefully to further support uh, trade and economic growth. Um, so um, I also want to talk, uh, final slide. So what are the sort of prescriptions? I like prescriptions. What can we do? So look, we have to increase access. Uh, you know, uh, Minister Antara mentioned this, that we need to get more people connected uh, because you think even, you look at just ASEAN, right? There's Myanmar with only 12, uh, 12, 12 and a half percent internet penetration, and Singapore up there, one of the top five in the world, right? And everything in between, and we need to fix that. Um, so, you know, one of the things, uh, there's so many things to do. We're hoping that later this year, we can test uh, Loon in Indonesia and see if that's and test it to see if it is a good tool to help um, Indonesian telcos better connect with customers in a, in a better priced way in the most remote areas of the country. 
I think the other thing is digital skills. We talked a lot about this. There was a discussion this morning about education. So how do we reach out and make sure people have the skills they need in this space? Um, you know, from doing digital training, basic education, digital training programs with school children, with adults, with would-be entrepreneurs, with established small businesses, anybody. Um, and also then regulation. So there's a lot of studies out there and data that says that um, what we need is free-flowing data and information across boundaries to really make the systems work and be very effective. But we also see is information that tells us that really what worries investors, what slows down those angel investors that can make these new and exciting um, apps or platforms blossom is a real fear of the um, unpredictability of regulation. So how can we develop processes with transparency, with information sharing, uh, with all sectors playing a role in the crafting of it to get good outcomes, and that, that will help. So finally, last slide, I promise, I want to talk just for a second about how we've seen that sort of collaboration work well in Indonesia, the program called Gopura. So you have an organization like Google that puts in a little bit of money and elbow grease and knowledge and the government participating widely to bring small businesses together to exchange ideas. But real, really makes it work is the small businesses who are online, who are passionate about being online, who share solutions to problems with each other, identify problems, identify solutions. Um, you know, earlier we talked about, somebody mentioned, you know, uh, Indonesian small businesses aren't online. And the truth is that most <coughs> Indonesian small businesses aren't online. But there are actually tens of thousands that are, and they're making an enormous difference. And I think the opportunity to highlight them as sort of uh, flag bearers to lead people on what would be really important. It's probably an inspiring way to bring the rest of the market on. And with that, I will get off the stage. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think you're bringing up uh, education because that's also very important to have the, we have at school a global online accreditation. Everything is online now, so thank you for that, and, and thank you, Anthony, for being a gentleman, because you will be last. I'm sure Zalora will be the big bang. So I would invite um, uh, Cynthia Derry from Australian uh, Services Roundtable, and um, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Cynthia, and thank you, Indonesian Services Dialogue, for organizing today's event. Um, it's great to have so many people together to be able to have a really good discussion about what needs to happen in the service se services sector, both here and internationally and regionally. Now, I'm speaking today on behalf of Australia's peak body for services, but I'm also speaking from the perspective of somebody who owns and runs an SME that operates internationally. So for a bit of context, I own a small international business consulting company and we use global value chains both to create the things that we make for our clients and we also are part of value global value chains because we uh, then export those things back overseas to people in other parts of the world so i'm speaking about this my understanding of global value chains is is a kind of personal one as well now um do i have a slide <laughs> to start with Thank you. So look, we've heard a lot about this today and I don't want to belabor the point, but I just do want to check that everybody actually knows what a global value chain is. Does, does anybody want to volunteer? Can anybody yell loudly enough to tell me what a global value chain is? <laughs> so nobody's brave, brave enough. A, a value chain is basically all the little pieces of activity that you do to make something, whether it's a good or it's a service. And so it won't come as a surprise to you that a global value chain is one that operates internationally. And we've seen this trend happening over a bunch of years because, you know, traditionally, um, goods and services were made in one country. And with travel, with telecommunications, with the internet, we've now seen the, all those component parts break down into little pieces so that, you know, you have your car or your mobile phone or even your, um, your, your airline travel or, or your education being produced across a number of countries. And that is basically what a GVC is. So that is what we're talking about today. And basically over the last, especially over the last decade or 15 years, we've seen these chains get more and more complicated and the number of countries in which things are being manufactured expand dramatically. Next slide, please. So 
we're here to talk about services, right? So what is that link between GVCs and services? Well, when you think about it, it's pretty simple. Um, traditionally, because services were intangible, they were anything that was not a physical good, it was really hard to capture that value. And so up until not so long ago, you know, we heard about it this morning, the services were the poor cousins of goods because they were labour intensive, and you couldn't capture that value, but we've really seen that change. And of course, digital technology has been a very, very key part of that. And so now, you know, um, services are important parts of, uh, services fit into global value chains just as services, but we've heard a lot about manufacturing today, and I just wanted to point out that one of the things that's very important and very interesting is that role that services play in advanced manufacturers. So did you know that at the moment, um, the highest value that goes into a good, so for example, if everybody's got an iPhone in here, most of the value in that iPhone of yours, more than 50%, has nothing to do with the hardware of the iPhone. So most of the value that's added into that iPhone has to do with the conception, so the basic idea for the phone, the design, um, the retail and the distribution. And the iPod is the same. So uh, many of these physical goods have got tons and tons of services components in them and that's where all that value is coming from. Now, global value chains are also really important for the services sector because at the moment they make up about 70% um, well, let me talk from an Australian perspective. Uh, services in global value chains contribute about 70% of our GDP and 75% of our total employment. So if you think about that, services jobs in Australia account for three out of four jobs. So we've seen that be, that's increasingly influential for, for our workforce. Next slide, please. So, Having skipped over that and just covered it off quickly, I, I guess I want to say Australia has traditionally not been a major player in global value chains. So often people look at Australia and think it's a pretty advanced economy, but actually we haven't been much of a GVC player. Now, what, what do I mean by that? Well, in a typical global value chain economy, um, players often import a lot of the inputs for a good or a service, and then they transform it and then they re-export it. Um, in Australia, on the other hand, the imported content in our exports has been pretty low and that's because we've had a comparative advantage at the start of the value chain. What I mean by that is that we've tended to focus on mining. So we've dug iron ore, copper, gold, other stuff out of the ground and instead of adding value, we've just shipped it out again. And so that's how we've made most of our money and we haven't really focused on adding that value. So a long time ago we had manufacturing industries and that has gradually been eroded by things like mining and by agriculture. We had the same kind of phenomenon in the agricultural sector. You know, we produced, uh, let's say, wheat or sheep or uh, cattle and we just shipped them offshore. We didn't do anything extra to add value to, to those things. Now, um, that is still the case today. So if I could have the next slide. Basically, our exports still have a very high share of domestic content and a really, really low share of foreign content. So if you, just for a couple of statistics, the, the domestic content in your Australian average export, whether it's a good or a service, is about 87%. That means most of it comes from Australia. And um, that's a bit shocking when you look at other OECD statistics because the OECD average is 76%, which means the OECD in general is bringing in a lot more value and then re-exporting. Now, if you look at ASEAN, ASEAN's doing even better uh, and its, its average of domestic content is 70 and China is at 67%. In Australia, our share of domestic content's only dipped a little bit over the last 15 years. Uh, and we have a very low share of foreign content as well. It's just around 12.5%. Now, why is that? Well, I mentioned mining and agriculture, but it's also because we have had difficulty accessing and participating in global and regional value chains. Now, that is part of that reason. And there are a bunch of further reasons be behind that that I, would want, that I don't really have time to go into, but um, you know, we might be able to talk about that later. Next slide. Please. So as I mentioned, 
our integration into global VG, into um, GVCs and global value chains is pretty low. And look, we've got quite a long way to go before we become a serious player in that space. Now, uh, this is something that in a way we share with Indonesia. There is a great graph that Jane actually gave me and I haven't put it into the slide deck, but it shows all these countries and how much they participate in global value chains. And Australia and Indonesia are actually right next to each other on this graph and they're both very small. So that indicates that uh, although our economies are quite different, both countries have some work to do to actually get better integrated into the, uh, the, the global value chain system. And I guess that raises the question of, well, look, how do, we, how do we do it? And I just want to spend the rest of the time talking about what we've learned about how we effectively participate in global value chains. Um, so, you know, as we've heard today, with the expansion of the service sector or services sector overall and in this world of GBCs, firms have many more opportunities than they used to to get into international markets and that's usually by providing these small intermediate services. Now I think you know the good news is that there's an overall trend towards greater regional economic integration and we've heard from Stephen today on uh, IACPA and from some of our other speakers and basically what that does is it opens up more opportunities for Australian businesses to partner with for example Indonesian companies in global value chains. Now a great example of this is the new Telcom uh, Telstra partnership that has been struck recently between our telecommunications services providers and essentially as I understand it we're using Australian uh, technology, soft technology and we're using Indonesian infrastructure and we're partnering up together to service both Australian, Indonesian and then other foreign, um, foreign clients and that's a great uh, example of one of those opportunities. But I think what is probably even more exciting is, as we've heard, you know, some of the opportunities for SME. So you no longer have to be Telstra or Telcom. Yeah, just just to um, to participate in that global value chain. So what have we what have we learned? Let me next slide, please. We've learned that efficiency in the local services sector is paramount. So that's lesson number one. Basically, if your services inputs into an export are inefficient, uh, then nothing works. A very quick example of that is um, my firm delivers training for clients overseas and we work with consultants offshore to actually you know, discuss projects and produce work. To do that, we use VoIP communications and the internet. Th that in those internet and those voice services are a services input into our services, which are part of your global value chain. If the internet doesn't work, if we can't use Zoom or Skype, then everything becomes inefficient and we can't do our job properly. Next slide, please. So government leadership and um, vision is really a key starting point. And I guess, you know, there are a bunch of things that I could say on that, but basically governments need to be providing the framework for better integration into global value chains. That's, you know, without that leadership, it's very, very hard for the business community to get anywhere. Again, there's a bunch of things that I could say on this, but in the interest of time, uh, the next slide would be great, please. So I've already talked a little bit about the internet, and I guess I just wanted to say here, high quality internet connectivity is essential because it basically is the backbone of so many things that we do. So, you know, if you're delivering anything that's not a physical service like a grease and oil change for the car, the chances are you're going to need the internet. So, if a country wants to become a hub for, let's say, providing uh, back-end services for airlines or insurance, all of those things are basically reliant on great internet connectivity. And I think at this point Indonesia might be doing a much better job than we are doing because my internet seems to function much better here than it does at home. <laughs> Next slide, please. Now, uh, there are just two more points. The regulatory framework really needs to support the services sector. What do I mean by that? Well, you, if your regulations don't facilitate the provision of services, 
you won't be able to integrate into a global value chain. And a very quick example of how we've experienced that in Australia is with a thing called 457 visas. And what a 457 visa does is it lets a company sponsor a foreign worker for a specific occupation if they can't find somebody who's qualified in Australia. And you can go to Australia for four years as a skilled uh, employee and do a particular job. Now, that's really important, in, for example, in our ICT, in our information, communications and technology sector. We've brought in about 10,000 programmers from India and from Ireland because we didn't have enough people with the right skills at home. And so that has basically helped us in certain sectors like education, like some of the other sectors that I've mentioned, to actually produce really good quality services because we have people who understand how the ICT works. And then lastly, I just wanted to say standards have to meet, inter have to meet international standards. So if you want to export something, you have to make sure that the standard of that thing that you have made, whether it's a good or a service, is acceptable internationally because when you go to plug it back into the global value chain, if it doesn't meet international standards, that's game over for you. And that's game over for me. Thanks for listening. Great. Thank you very much. from Zalora and maybe you could share a little bit of e-commerce and the payment the way. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I actually won't be that long. Uh, I actually have only three slides. Uh, to give everyone a little bit of background about what we do, uh, we're a Southeast Asia-based company um, focused only on the fashion space, uh, e-commerce, and our goal is to be the fashion destination in Indonesia and all across Southeast Asia to be the best place to sell and buy fashion products, right? And um, do we actually have some slides? Um, Oh, is it this one? Okay. I can't even recognize myself. Uh, so, uh, so I always tell people like internet, e-commerce is actually the toughest internet business that you can ever find in the world. Why? Because it's literally you're doing servicing so many different clients and you have so many different partners to make the e-commerce like train rolling, right? And it's almost, as I always like to say, it's like you're running a mini economy within a company because like from payments to logistics to you know SMEs you know every day you have to deal with so many of the problems right it's like you know government right so uh, um, so let's maybe go to the next slide um, so first of all why is e-commerce important for the service industry because we are the service industry we help every SME uh, around the world and in particular Indonesia to sell to the Indonesian consumer uh, at Salor today, we have more than 1,500 suppliers and 90% of them are actually SMEs scattered all across Indonesia from Denpasar, Jakarta to Bandung. And every day we help them sell to all around Indonesia. So e-commerce by itself is a service industry and we help these manufacturing companies to get to the customers that they would have never reached by themselves. Uh, next slide. Next slide is tele telecommunication. Why telecom is one of the most important partners we need for e-commerce business. At the end of the day, people need the internet to buy something. And as of today, in Indonesia, 85% of our transactions are happening on the mobile phone. Um, either people you know, buy the stuff from the app or through the mobile browsers. This is drastically different from two years ago where you know, 15, 20% of people bought from the mobile phone. Today, Indonesia is a truly mobile first, uh, you know, mobile economy. Every e-commerce needs to think first about mobile and telecoms need to significantly improve their speed. I think you know, people here in Jakarta are very lucky that you know, it's actually very fast. You know, like when I'm in Jakarta, you know, I think the speed is decently fast, but actually when I'm in Jogja or you know, when I'm in like, you know, Kalimantan Sulawesi, it's actually quite slow, right? I remember when I was a time when I was in Jogja, uh, I think one and a half years ago, I was trying to like use my mobile phone to browse Solora, but it was so slow that I actually gave up and just watched TV instead. <laughs> so, uh, you know, so, so telecommunication is very, very, very important for our business because, you know, the amount of transactions is actually correlated to the speed of internet. 
there are very, very robust studies to show that the faster your internet speed, the faster your conversion rate uh, of people buying on your website will be. And uh, if you want to grow the e-commerce industry, you got to have fast internet connection. And especially in Indonesia where mobile is very important. Last slide I'm going to talk about is uh, logistics. Logistics is our daily business, you know. Indonesia has more than 12,000 islands and we ship tens and thousands of packages every day to customers all around Indonesia. And I think, you know, this is also a service industry that we definitely cannot forget, is in particular in, in Indonesia. Indonesia is one of the most challenging logistics places uh, to do e-commerces because there's so many like islands, you know, to reach the customer, it might first involve like a train uh, and then a plane and then, you know, motorbikes to get to consumers. So this is very, very hard compared to like, you know, China or Russia. Because in China, you could reach almost everywhere by train, by land. Here, sometimes by sea, sometimes by plane, sometimes by motorbikes, right? So this is something, uh, has never been solved in e-commerce. That's why we actually have our own logistics fleet in some of the major cities to tackle the situations ourselves. So for Salora, in some of the bigger cities like Jakarta, Bandung, um, Sulo, uh, Surabaya, Denpasar, we actually have our own delivery fleet because we don't trust the service uh, offered from the you know uh, partners. Uh, sometimes they cannot fulfill the requirements that we need. That's what we have to do it ourselves. So last point is logistics. It's very, very important for our business and very, very important for Indonesia if you want to grow the e-commerce industry. Thank you.